Bullshit. It's the No BS Marketing Show. I'm Dave Mastovich. Our guest today is Natalie Benzavenga. But first, let's hit the bullseye. I've been a fan of the Showtime drama Billions since the first episode, The Night It Dropped. The series was created by Brian Koppelman, who I've been a fan of for years, David Levine, and Andrew Ross Sorkin. It features top-notch writing and storytelling loosely based on the activities of Preet Bharara, the former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, and his legal battles with hedge fund manager Steve Cohen of SAC Capital Advisors. The season three finale recently aired, and Alec, my son, and I are trying to decide whether season three is as good or better than season two, or is season one the best? But season three featured the quant team driving decision-making through analytics more than intuition. Whether you agree with that or not, and Natalie and I touched on that in episode one, you do need to maximize the data you own, the free data that can actually be gold for you and your marketing team. I'm continually surprised at how many companies fail to leverage that data from a no BS marketing perspective. You need to provide your strategic marketing leaders with data they need to make decisions. And if your marketing team isn't craving for more and better data, you need to find someone who will. Whether that's from an outside source or a new internal team member, doesn't matter as much as committing to gathering, crunching, and using the data about your customers and their behaviors. We call it our Pareto Principle Plus. Most people have heard about the Pareto Principle or 80-20 rule where 80% of your business comes from 20% of your customers. That's the bare minimum of what you need to review from a marketing perspective. Our Pareto Principle Plus has 52 different ways that we look at the data, which leads to marketing solutions that improve the top and bottom line. Bobby Axelrod of Axe Capital and the show Billions has, well, well, spoiler alert, had Taylor Mason and her quant team, but you don't need that level of sophistication just yet. Your first step is to make sure you have at least one strategic marketing leader on your team doing the real drill down of your segments and customer data. And Natalie is going to talk to us about her target segments and how they've drilled that down. You get that data to your marketing leader, crunch the numbers from a marketing perspective, not just the CFO crunching the numbers. Let your marketing team come back with no BS marketing solutions that hit the bullseye for your organization. Our guest today is Natalie Bensavenga. She's a Mid-Atlantic Emmy nominee and the scene editor at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. She's also a fellow Pittsburgh podcaster hosting the show, The Broadcast Pittsburgh Podcast, where she shares women's stories. In our first episode, Natalie gave us some tremendous information. She told us about her background and how she had the two-day mag for five years focusing on healthy relationships. She was on a Fox News online show. She built a company to where she had 14 writers and 25,000 readers a month. She had a business partner. She had the courage to realize that her and her business partner, while still personally uh, friends, they weren't a fit to continue the relationship. She had the courage to move forward with that. She realized that to go back and pick up some additional schooling in an area that she was passionate about, she emphasized how important passion is to your job. And then we got into some of the nitty gritty details uh, that focused on some of the mentors she has and one of her favorite quotes from Ariana Huffington that collaboration is the new competition. And then at the tail end of episode one, we started talking about the many, many components of the scene platform, if you will, and the target audience. And she talked about how she's always surprised at how many guys read the column. So Natalie, let's jump into episode two, where you can drill down more and tell us a little bit about those target markets, like I mentioned in the uh, Hit the Bullseye Pareto Principle Plus. Yeah. So so what's interesting is about three years ago, the uh, Post-Gazette asked me to also pick up the advice column. So then I started working on Ask Natalie, which I'd always wanted. I'd had an advice column with my webzine many years ago. And so it was fun to revisit that. And now having my social work background, I thought it would be a great, a great new platform for myself. But I didn't want it to feel completely disjointed from the scene. So I wanted people to understand that this was the same person writing both. And so what I started doing with the advice column was putting at the end of each column a networking tip, because I felt like that could help sort of dovetail the work I was doing with the scene column with the new piece that I was picking up with Ask Natalie, because at the end of the day, 
I'm trying to be one cohesive brand, even though I'm doing all of these different things. And so when I started thinking about my audience, I was like, okay, well, who's reading scene? A lot of those people are already reading this column. They may be interested in reading the advice column, but this advice column may be a lot of people that aren't reading scene. And so how do you dovetail the two? And that's why I thought the networking team, the networking tip every week would be a good way to sort of create that synergy between the two pieces. And now the uh, the advice column has become uh, digitally syndicated on a national level, which has been really exciting because now the the audience is so much bigger for the advice column. And I'm hoping to bring some of that energy that I'm I'm picking up there and bring them into reading the scene column because even though the scene column is Pittsburgh based, a lot of these ideas and themes are really much more universal. And so I'm hoping to start just creating a sense of synergy and understanding that what my really big idea here is about we are all in this together and that constructive conversation can lead to positive action that can make great changes for all of us. And that's sort of what I want people to take away that when they're looking at, at my work. And so when you drill down to audience, I have a lot of different people reading a lot of different um, pieces, but I think what a lot of them have in common, regardless of their age or regardless of their demographic, is they're all looking for good news and they're all looking for news they can use that's helpful and positive and making a difference. And so that to me, regardless of who they are, that's the messaging that I think that they're coming to me for, and that's the messaging that I'm trying to put out there. Interesting, because as we've talked, and I did some preparation for the interview, and the plus we talked at the Pittsburgh Business Show, and then we talked before the mic went live, and I was thinking about your big idea, and you actually kind of have multiple big ideas that are are really strong because this one is you're mentioning all they're all looking for good news they can use and you mm -hmm. have this whole platform which is about uh, you giving advice that and news that they can use through the scene column and ask natalie but then there was also something you really said that uh, you said that was really intriguing to me and i thought was was really insightful you said I want people to understand why we need these parties and we need these mm -hmm. parties because we need these organizations. Yes. So before I let you elaborate on that, I'm going to actually put you on the spot to, to go through one of the things we talk about on the no BS marketing show is uh, Simon Sinek's book, start with why, when it came out, I read it and it was really inspirational for me because I said, this is great for me and other CEOs because we have to understand our why our reason mm -hmm. for being as a company. Mm -hmm. And I, I would argue you have to understand it as a person. Mm -hmm. But after reading that, I said, that's only one of the two why questions from a marketing standpoint, because the second why question is your customers, why their reason for buying or choosing mm -hmm. your platform. And when you can answer those two whys, your why or reason for being and your customers, why their reason for buying, the answers to those two questions can coalesce and be one big idea. Now, those two answers aren't exactly the same, but there's enough that's usually the same that you can then come up with what that one big idea is for you or your company. So I'm going to challenge you because it sounds like you actually have a couple of great mm -hmm. big ideas. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I'm still working through a lot of this, right? This is all building as we go. And I, I always say when I, when I took on media work, because I came from a science background, I kind of came in the side door instead of the front door. So <laughs> I'm still learning as I, as I go. But, but I think for me, the why was always the idea of transformational conversation. So it's not enough just to, I, I didn't want it to just, like I said earlier, I didn't want it to just be about the party, but why we need the party and the transformative nature of, of journalism and how there can be a call to action. So for me, that was really important to, to showcase the great people and the great events happening in the community, but more importantly, why we need the organizations that are being supported by the communities. And it's because they're upholding a lot of the pillars of Pittsburgh and in general in society, you know, whether it be, you know, 412 Food Rescue, which is helping to end food insecurity, they're having a big culinary event. Okay, that's great. I'm going to go to the party. It'll be fun. But I want to make sure I talk to Leah Lizarondo, the founder of 412 Food Rescue, and get an interview discussing the issue of food insecurity in Pittsburgh. Because to me, I'm going to hook people with, oh, look, look at all these fabulous people here. But look, here's Here's what's really going on, and here's why they need you to donate. Here's why it's important for you to be there. So 
with with all the work that I do, whether it's with scene or even with the broadcast, you know, the idea of amplifying women's voices, it just felt like there wasn't enough space in in the podcasting world for that. And so when our, my co-host and I decided to start that project, it was not just about having conversations with women, but at the end, you know, whatever issue that they're talking about or whatever they're discussing or whatever their business is, we wanted there to be a call to action and something that people could do to then follow up. So transformative conversation was my why. And then I think why people come to the scene column or why they read the advice column or why they listen to the broadcast is many people like myself, I think are very tired and over it in terms of the divisiveness of this country. I'm, I'm sick of it. And I want to build bridges. I want there to be, there are many, many more reasons for us to come together than to not be together. And I think the things that have been dividing us in the past 10, 15 years have grown. But when you really drill down to what they are, they're they're superfluous and they're superficial. And we actually, a lot of us, want the same things for ourselves and for our family and for our children and for our environment. And so my thought with the scene column and with the advice column and with the broadcast and all these other projects that I want to work on and setting the scene is let's talk about the things that connect us because people want to be connected. We are more socially isolated, oddly enough, than ever before, even though we have all these forms of communication, nobody's really communicating. So let's talk about ways in which we can interact in positive ways that make us feel good about ourselves and each other. And I think that's why people are coming to to see this work and to be a part of this work, because they want to feel good again. I agree. There's You made a number of points that are so relevant that most of us have similarities in most of our thoughts, Mm -hmm. but we have differences in maybe a third or less of our thoughts. And I say substantive, but Mm -hmm. the the core values of most people, like people don't wake up and go, let me make the environment shitty. Right, right, (laughs) Um, right. So, but yet it's painted that way. And uh, so I like that you're focusing on talking about the things that connect us. So that's one key piece. I also like the idea of how you have a platform and I'm really impressed at how you guys have pulled this all together. And I give... Um, you and and your partner uh, a, a lot of credit, but I also give the Post Gazette a ton of credit because they had the scene and the style, and they said let's get these two together and turn them loose. Mm-hmm. Because for a stodgy newspaper mindset to be gone and to let you guys mm-hmm. try all the things you're trying and you're having success because you're trying things, and you guys get the new media better than a lot of people, it's it's impressive to see how that's gone out there. And I like how you looked at all the different target markets within uh, within your platform. Um, so uh, it's just impressive. So to the Ask Natalie that is now digitally digitally syndicated, mm-hmm. uh, talk about that a little bit. Give that shout out and how how many places have it and yeah. So it's so I was uh, asked maybe it's been about I've just started working with them in January. So it's new and it's it's the Universal Press Syndicate. So it's the same people that syndicate Dear Abby, Miss Manners, the Ziggy Comics, basically the biggest syndicator in the country and I was approached by my one of my editors and he said they were interested in in digitally syndicating my work. So it's it's the first step of you know being put out there in other newspapers or other publications, but everything is so digital now that a digital syndication deal is kind of where it, where it's at right now or what people are doing. So now my work is living on uexpress.com. So, so it's really, letter U. it's really, it's really, yeah, that's right. That's something to help change my mindset because I'm mis misreading that is that it's not like you'd be on 50 different media outlet websites. You have this one website that's the people then Google and go to that. Correct. Cause it's, it's so if you, if you Google dear Abby, you know, she's living on now you express, which is their, their big digital platform. Mm-hmm. And, and you express is the company then that, you know, if dear Abby's syndicated in 10 different or 20 different or how many different papers, they're also the ones distributing that. So now I'm living on the same platform as dear Abby is. And so that's really exciting because I've picked up so many new readers. It's been so exciting. It's doing really well. The The first couple of months, I, I haven't talked with them since, but it's it was the third most read um, third most read column on their whole website just under Dear Abby and Miss Manners. So I think that people are connecting to this work. And it was really cool to see that because when we were talking about analytics, I know how the Pittsburgh market's reacting to it. But to be able to put it out there on a national platform and have eyeballs from all over the country, all different types of people reading it 
And, you know, some of these articles now are, some of my pieces are getting, you know, 150, 200 comments on them. It's so fascinating to see how people are engaging with the work, which is exactly what you want as a writer, whether they love to love you or love to hate you, as long as they are reading it, it's, it's thrilling. And so that experience has really set me down the next road. Okay, this is working. I've been following my, my instincts on on why I think this is working, but now the numbers are showing me that this is working as well. So like you said, it's that mix of the art and the science and really understanding that that audience. So that that work is now all living, all of my archived Ask Natalie pieces from the past three years are now living on that site and new work uh, that I do goes up there every week. So it's uexpress.com. And it's still obviously at the Post-Gazette. It runs in the paper every Monday and then you can you know read about it or read the columns on the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette's website as well. The No BS Marketing Show is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audible.com slash no BS. Over 200,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Try a book like Factfulness, 10 Reasons We're Wrong About the World and Why Things Are Better Than You Think by Hans Rosling. Listen to it for free today by going to audible.com slash no BS. We're with Natalie Benzavenga, who's telling us all kinds of cool stuff that no BSers can really leverage and uh, just impressive that you're able to achieve this national following. So pick a pick a relationship advice column that's short enough that you can kind of just walk me through so I can get a, a sense of what it's like. So, <laughs> so when I always answer, I try to answer two questions every week. And what's been great is now that it's been open to a more national audience, I'm getting a lot of questions from you know, just all different perspectives. That's been really interesting. But so it's two questions every week. Uh, They ask, and these are in-depth questions. People are asking me really intense relationship style questions, whether they deal with, you know, mental health issues or substance abuse or uh, just relationship questions. It's not, it's not Dan Savage. It's not a sex column. So I don't really touch on that sort of line of of uh, questioning but what i really do focus on when people ask me questions about the relationship is intimacy so i touch on that a lot and then work related questions i get a lot of stuff about um people asking how do you you know work uh relate to your boss or how do you deal with issues in the workplace and after the me too movement began i got a lot of influx of questions from women and men about how do you deal with the changing landscape in the workplace so i actually did just a special commentary piece on the Me Too movement and just how to address. I had so many questions. I was just trying to address some of the uh, more general aspects of, is it okay to do X, Y, and Z? When do you know? How can you relate to people? And and really talked a lot about power differentials, which I think is a very key point in discussing any relationship in the workplace, um, is always being aware of your level of power and understanding how that power then relates to other people that you work for or with or that work under you. So understanding your place in the scheme of things can help alleviate a lot of these issues. So the, the questions vary from week to week. And then at the end of every, at the end of both questions, after I've given my answers, I put my networking tip of the week, which has been great because like we were talking about, you know, when you're, when you're marketing yourself, when you're a brand, when you're a product or whatever you're selling, you have to also be thinking about, okay, if I want to do speaking engagements, if I want to do, if how do I monetize this in other ways? Well, if I start putting out work that shows that I'm talking about young leadership, that I'm talking about networking, I can then get hired to speak on these topics. Or, you know, if I'm talking about, um, the social landscape of the community or um, the philanthropic nature, nature of a community, I can then consult on these topics. And I've started consulting. I've been, I've, I've done some consulting for now a few years just on leveraging digital media and social media. So, so also learning not only about the work that you're doing, but then how can you leverage it to create other revenue streams? Because this is an uncertain time in our economy. It has been for a while. It's good to have multiple balls in the air because in case one drops, you've still got a few that you can keep going until you can pick that other one back up. Well, you're used to getting questions and and being able to give advice, but now I'm going to put you on the spot since it's an OBS marketing show. (laughs) Tell us about a time in your career when you were the BS or maybe you were the difficult employee, tough boss, or maybe you didn't communicate as well as you could have. What was it? What did you do to fix it? And what did you learn that would help our audience? So definitely when I was working at, this is one of the things I, I regretted uh, looking back, but I did make amends and and we're completely fine now, but I felt really badly about it. I I was working as, as a, th- a mobile therapist for a company here in Pittsburgh, and I would basically go around to different communities and work with children that had severe, severe mental health issues in the home. 
So I was doing that for about a, about a year before the PG came about. And I started realizing how unhappy I was on a very visceral level. And so I, I was putting the feelers out for the PG, started taking the um, interviews with the PG. Didn't really let my boss know anything was going on, that I wasn't happy, that I wasn't, didn't want to stay. That So basically what ended up happening was the Post-Gazette hired me and I, I quit my social work job and I gave them two weeks, what ended up turning into six months. So I ended up working two jobs full time for six months because because I hadn't given them lead time. I didn't realize having never worked in the field in the way that it was that you just can't quit clients because these are children and these are these are families that it's a whole thing. They don't they didn't have somebody to replace me because I'm a independent contractor and, and it's all outsourced work. And I was good friends with the the um, CEO's wife, which really made things uncomfortable because she felt like I had been lying to her. But really, I was I was so focused on myself and what I needed and what I wanted. I was just being really selfish. And I wasn't thinking about how I was impacting all of these other people. So definitely the biggest regret and the thing that I've learned moving forward is be much more transparent and much more communicative about your needs and where you are in your career. And don't be afraid. I, I think looking back, I was afraid to say anything because I didn't want her to get mad. I didn't want him to get upset. But looking back, I made it way worse than it needed to be because I just wasn't being honest with them or myself. And so I think at the end of the day, if you're willing, if you're wanting to leave a position or you're unhappy with what's going on, you need to communicate those feelings and talk about them. Even if that conversation may be uncomfortable and even if it may not give you the best outcome, it's better than uh, betraying somebody that you didn't intend to to ever hurt. And and that was something that I held on to for a long time. I felt so much guilt about it, even after, I mean, we're completely fine and we're still really good friends, but you know, it bought it bothered me looking back on that because I just behaved so selfishly in what I was trying to achieve. We're with Natalie Benzavenga. That was a great answer. Thank you for that. And for the loyal no BSers out there, there you have it. She gives advice nationally and she's telling you something that she's being vulnerable about and it all worked out, but you had guilt for a long time mm-hmm. and it made it awkward because it's just really tough for us to have the difficult conversations and you talk about the transformative conversations. And I think that's what a, a transformative conversation can be when you say, yep. here's the way I see it. I know you might not agree and here's where I want to get to. Can we work this out to get there together? Yeah, have courage and you know, recognize that <laughs> while it may not seem like it's going to work out, usually things do end up working out the way they're supposed to. <laughs> well, tell us about your biggest marketing or storytelling obstacle. Mm. For me, I think the the biggest issue with marketing and storytelling is getting people to understand the importance of social media as part of their marketing strategy and that it is a long-term strategy. Because a lot of people that I work with or that I consult with, they know they're supposed to be doing it, but they're doing it in such a haphazard way or they're doing it with no editorial calendar or they're doing it in a way that's not cohesive that you might as well not be doing it. And so they're not seeing results from it and they're also expecting results way too quickly. You know, when, whenever I sit with somebody and say, okay, if you want to really build up your digital media presence, let's tackle a few platforms to start. You can't tackle them all. So let's start with maybe two or three that we think would be the most valuable assets to your particular company. But then let's actually sit down and make a editorial calendar. And this is something that we use in journalism that you can also use in marketing, which is what is my story? Let's lay out all the stories that I want to tell over the next six weeks or all the stories I want to tell over the next six months. And how do they all make sense? How do they all align? What is the vision? Because what I see a lot of on on social media is people don't understand how standalone posts mean nothing. Everything is about the greater picture. When you're on Instagram, people are looking at nine squares. They're not looking at one. Every, you know, your your page shows nine. Are those nine in the same context? Are they in the same color scheme? Do they look like your company? What what are they what is the vision of those nine? And then from there, it's getting people to understand that this is important. Social media is where people are 
socializing. This is where we are sharing ideas. This is where we're sharing thoughts. And it's not enough to have a one, one-way one conversation. You have to interact. You have to like other people's posts. You have to share other people's work. It's that collaboration as competition coming back to you again, right? So it's not enough just to speak to your audience. You have to have a dialogue with your audience. And also you have to be prepared to be in this for at least six to 12 months and hold on because your analytics aren't really going to show much growth or or you know, or no growth either way, unless we see what our baseline is. I need six months to understand where I'm going because if I'm working with you and let's say you have 200 followers on Instagram and you have a goal of 5,000 followers on Instagram, well, first of all, having 5,000, what does that number mean? And engagement rate is something that people aren't really thinking about when they're thinking of numbers because if you have 5,000 people that follow you but three like your photos – or three like your links, or they link through, then what's your engagement rate? It's pathetic. So instead, let's not worry so much about numbers. Let's worry more about what is our percent engagement. Because in any ad campaign, you know, if you can get five to eight percent engagement, you're doing great. If you can get it over 10 percent, you're doing really great. So how do you translate that then into sales? Well, it all starts first with understanding that you need to be present and engaged. And and that's tough for a lot of companies that have never had to go into this market and they're not seeing a return on investment immediately and they get really frustrated and they think you're not doing anything and, and you're trying to explain to them, no, we're building, we're building community. And the word community is also confusing, I think, for a lot of people in business because their idea is cons- consumer or or um, client, but you have to change that C word now to community and think about it a little differently. So those are some of the obstacles that I experience is trying to get people to understand the importance, the relevance, and how everything is moving to online and digital media. That's just the way it is. Get on board. (laughs) Folks, that was the equivalent of Steph Curry hitting seven three-pointers in one game. So here we're going to go through the seven (laughs) three-pointers. Number one, Social media is a long-term strategy. Number two, standalone posts mean nothing. It's about the greater vision. Number three, hold on for six to 12 months because your analytics won't show growth in the short term. Number four, don't worry about numbers. Worry about percent of engagement. If you have 5,000 followers and only one likes something, that's pathetic. I don't know if that was your exact quote. <laughs> it's pretty you close. Need, <laughs> you need to be present and engaged. And this is hard for leaders and especially leaders over the age of 40. Uh, and it's a big adjustment. I can admit personally, it's a big adjustment because you have to just think differently and do things differently. Six, she talked about the community aspect and seven, how everything is going online. So get on board. Board. Drop in three point pearls of wisdom, Natalie Benzavenga. <laughs> Natalie, was there anything you thought I'd ask that I didn't? Hmm. You know, I really wasn't sure what we would what we would discuss because uh, you know I li- I really liked your show and um, I was so happy when I got to meet and engage with you because it's always exciting to talk about these things. But I think what's uh, intrigued me the most is how, and not that I'm not surprised, but I, I appreciate how forward thinking that you are on the way you're looking at marketing as storytelling. Because I think as we move forward into the new world of media, media and marketing are really simpatico and people need to understand that that one feeds the other. So how do we do that in a way that is constructive and healthy? And I think that's, that's what's been great about being on this is being able to talk about media in ways that it can be healthy and constructive and how you can market to that energy instead of making it divisive and destructive. Awesome. One thing I think we didn't do enough about is let's spend a minute talking about the broadcast Pittsburgh uh, yes. and and how, how you go about that. And I guess I told you before I had sampled uh, about 10 of them for mm-hmm. portions of it. And I saw that wine was mentioned a lot. So I brought in, <laughs> I brought in shots, which nobody can see. But I, I said, I don't have wine here, but I have a shot of tequila, a shot of Jaeger and a shot of fireball but uh, talk about the broadcast the broadcast came about uh, my co-host and co-producer Kim Lyons who's an incredible journalist here in the in the city of Pittsburgh and she's written for all all types of publications including the New York Times uh, we really had been wanting to work on a project for years together and the timing felt right um, during the election season when we assumed you know we we both thought Hillary would win and when she was when we thought she was going to win, we thought this will be a great time for a, a female podcast. We can break that glass ceiling and we can talk about all the amazing women breaking glass ceilings. And then when it didn't happen, we thought this is even a more important time <laughs> for this podcast because we need to understand why women aren't being put in positions of power. And and, and maybe we maybe now is 
the way I have to think about it is you don't wait, you just do it yourself. Because if the door doesn't open, you, you create your own door. So we decided we were just going to create our own podcast called The Broadcast PGH to really amplify women's voices. But once again, I have to say I was, I'm was i always surprised when I'm out in the community and I have so many men that listen to our show because in the beginning I thought – or men came up to me saying, well, are you going to be male bashing on this show? And I said, no. Why would we do that? The show isn't about men. And then that upset them even more because <laughs> they, they were like, what do you mean it's not about men? Well, it's not about you. It's about what these women are doing with their careers and their lives and their and their and their personal endeavors. And and so really, it's just a show about really amazing women that are doing great things in Pittsburgh and beyond. And our hope and our our, our real dream is to make it much more of a national reach in terms of the types of guests that we have on. And um, so you can find us, you know. It's the broadcast PGH. You can go onto Facebook. We have Instagram. We're on Twitter, and you can you can find us online as well. And uh, we try to post something new every week. And it's just been such a great project to to work on with with Kim and uh, to just have these experiences. And I've met so many interesting women. It's been another great way to to network. And we've gotten to go on other people's podcasts as well too, which is how you know we got to meet. I got to hear Pittsburgh Girl's voice. That's right. <laughs> That's the first episode I went to. I was like, oh, I read some of her stuff, and I've never heard her, her voice. So That's was... so funny. There you go. <laughs> Whatever. Well, thank you for being on the show. It was excellent. Thank you so much for having me. To our loyal listeners, thanks for joining us for the No BS Marketing Show, brought to you by Audible.com. Remember, go to audible.com slash no BS to get a free download and 30-day free trial, access to over 200,000 titles. Visit MassSolutions.biz for show notes, which might include a picture of the shots this time, plus additional marketing and messaging resources. Sign up for the No BS Marketing Weekly Update. You'll receive timely, valuable ideas to improve your marketing and transform your message. It's light, intended to be read in two minutes or less, and it just might trigger bright ideas for you. Again, that's MassSolutions.biz. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? And build your story around the answer. It's all about bold solutions. No BS.